Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to review some of what we talked about last time. So I'm going to share with you guys kind of a general definition and some examples of autobiographical memories. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how autobiographical memories are cognitively represented, right? So what is, what is the nature of autobiographical memories? And lastly, we're going to talk about how autobiographical memories change across the lifespan. So uh, how does your memory for events and experiences, um, what, is, or what is the relationship between your memory for events and experiences and the particular age that you were when those events and experiences occurred? Okay. So we're going to talk about something called the reminiscence bump. And I'm going to share some uh, theories that cognitive psychologists uh, posit to explain those. So there's the self-image hypothesis, the cognitive hypothesis, and the cultural life script hypothesis. So like I said, a lot of this is going to be review from last time, um, just to make sure we're all caught up and in the same place. Okay. So autobiographical memories. Um, so pretty much prior to this point, when we would ever, when we were talking about uh, memories, we were restricting ourselves to very specific scenarios. Um, so for example, we would talk about memory for trigrams or memories for basic lists of words or memories for passages that you would find in an SAT prep book, for example. And those particular cases were certainly interesting and had a lot of value uh, from a scientific perspective because we were able to keep things very uh, controlled, right? Um, but in terms of the real life application, right, it was probably somewhat minimal. Uh, so now what we're going to talk about uh, uh, in our discussion of, of autobiographical memory is memory for more uh, relevant information or memory for um, things that have uh, more of an application to what uh, each of us experiences in our daily lives. Okay, so let's start with a, with a basic definition of what autobiographical memory is. So autobiographical memory is, of course, your memory for specific experiences in your life. Um, but those experiences can take uh, many forms. So your memory for those experiences can take many forms. Um, and just like when we talk about uh, memory for trigrams or memory for words or memories for what you're reading about, um, for example, in, in a diary, right? We can talk about autobiographical memories as being both episodic and semantic. So the example that I gave in class was of a childhood birthday party, right? So if you're, what you're remembering is a very specific birthday party, right? So I told you guys, I gave you the example of my six, um, or the, the birthday party I had when I was six years old, right? So I remember that very well because it was my first birthday party where my mom and dad let me invite uh, ch other children from my class. Um, and I remember that we decorated the whole house with this kind of balloon theme. So I had, you know, a little paper ta uh, tablecloth and paper plates and napkins that all matched and so forth. Um, so that's an example of an episodic autobiographical memory because I'm thinking back to a particular instance, right? So in this case, I'm talking about um, some form of mental time travel, if you will, back to a specific place and a specific instance. Uh, but for example, if I were uh, to think about when my birthday happens, right, or the day of my birthday, right, and mark it on a calendar, I would know that my birthday was June 23rd, right? So that's more of a discrete fact, which I know to be true without necessarily having to call up a particular birthday, 
right? So that's an example of a semantic autobiographical memory. And similarly, if I were to get uh, an invitation to a birthday party in my email or in snail mail, if anybody does that anymore, um, and I were to see this invitation, I would know generally what happens at a birthday party, right? So I would know that there's usually cake or some kind of dessert offered. I would know that usually it's customary to bring a gift, etc. Um, and all of that information is based on my prior experience of attending birthday parties, but it doesn't necessarily necessitate that I think about one particular birthday party. Okay, so that's our first objective here, is just to talk about what autobiographical memories are, how we define them, and so forth. Uh, so our next objective is to talk about how autobiographical memories are represented in the mind. So what does that look like? Well, one of the things that I asked you guys to do when we were in class together uh, is I asked you to call a particular autobiographical memory to mind, right? So I asked you to think about a particular event in your life for 30 seconds, right? And so when I asked you guys to do that, my follow-up question was to um, not only tell me what that event was, um, but also to talk about all of the different features uh, that were associated with that memory. So even after just thinking about that memory for about 30 seconds, uh, most of you uh, told me that there were very distinct visual features that were prompted when you did that exercise. Right. So like I was saying before, autobiographical memories are always going to involve some sort of mental time travel, right, where you transport yourself back to another place and time. Right. So if you're going to another place and time in your mind, that means that your surroundings are going to change and you're going to conjure up visual images of where you are. Okay, similarly, a lot of you said that you uh, recalled particular conversations or things either that you said or that were said to you. So there's very clearly an auditory component as well. Many of you also experienced other kinds of sensory information. So in some cases, um, there were interesting sorts of smells or tastes. Um, that were associated with your memories, okay? And there's sometimes also um, various kinds of spatial information, which is again representative of the fact that you're in a new environment, okay? And a lot of times autobiographical memories are going to have a strong emotional component. Um, and depending upon the nature of the memory, whether you're talking about uh, a birthday party or maybe a more traumatic event like a memory for being in a car accident, okay, there can either be positive or negative emotions associated with them. Okay. So when we talk about autobiographical memory, we can describe it as being multidimensional. And that just means that it's, that it's something that um, activates a lot of different features in the mind. In particular, a lot of researchers have uh, demonstrated that autobiographical memories are highly visual. Uh, and the importance that, uh, the important role that uh, the vision centers of the brain uh, plays uh, is the case whether the particular memory has a visual component or not. Right? So we see this by looking at individuals who have suffered damage to the visual cortex, which is a region of the, of the, temporal, um, of the temporal lobe. Um, and we see that these individuals have a fairly pronounced deficit in being able to recall autobiographical memories. And like I said, that's the case regardless of whether those memories have a visual component. So these individuals who have suffered from what's called cortical blindness 
are less able to recall, not just, for example, the layout of their uh, grandmother's old house, um, but also potentially the, the lyrics to their favorite song, right? Um, so regardless of the uh, actual dimensions of the memory itself, there seems to be a pretty pronounced deficit in autobiographical memory, right? So we take that as kind of indirect evidence that autobiographical memory is multidimensional or that it involves the integration of multiple different types of information. Okay. All right, so the next question that we're gonna tackle together in this lecture is we're gonna talk about how our memories for our events and experiences change across the lifespan. So we're going to talk about uh, what factors uh, make it more likely that you're later going to be able to recall events and experiences in your life. Right? So one of those factors is just the relative importance of those events. So for example, researchers uh, like Paul Philomer, for example, administered a survey to around 5,000 people where he basically just asked them to provide detailed reports of their most memorable experiences. And he found that there were a couple of common themes. So for example, people tended to give more detailed and more accurate reports of events that were associated with achieving personal milestones. So, for example, almost everyone was able to generate a fairly in-depth uh, recollection of, of graduating from college or accepting a marriage proposal or maybe getting married, right? Um, so events that are associated with achieving a personal goal or some kind of important development in one's life were more, were more memorable. Um, and highly emotional or somewhat traumatic memories were also more memorable. So for example, losing a spouse, losing a parent, surviving a car accident, um, uh, being diagnosed with cancer, right? So all of these sorts of um, potential traumatic events are more uh, recallable or easier to remember um, than other sorts of events. But there's also something interesting that happens. Um, so in this particular study, uh, they asked people aged 54 uh, to again sort of describe their most uh, memorable experiences. And they found a pattern. So these individuals were able to generate memories from all across the lifespan. Right? So they were able to talk about some memories that occurred in childhood, for example, at age five, all the way through adolescence uh, and adulthood and even later adulthood. Right, So there was kind of a span of memories, um, but most recent memories were more recallable, which makes sense, right? We know that as the delay increases between the initial experience and when you're asked to recall it, obviously it's going to be harder, right? So it makes sense that people are generally able to recall some memories from uh, even early childhood, um, but that more recent experiences are gonna be easier to remember. Um, but the really curious thing is that people tended to have an easier time recalling events that had occurred either in adolescence or early adulthood, right? So we call this ease of recall for events occurring between the ages of 10 and 30, the reminiscence bump, right? So it's the idea that when we reminisce or try to remember these events, we have an easier time during this critical period between the ages of 10 and 30. 
So now we're going to shift our focus to trying to explain why this reminiscence bump occurs. Um, so right now, cognitive psych psychologists have uh, proposed three different hypotheses as to why this might happen. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these three hypotheses together. Okay, so the first hypothesis as to why the reminiscence bump occurs is called the self-image hypothesis. Um, so some of you might remember that one of the exercises I asked you to do in class is I asked you to tell me, um, I asked you to generate rather three I am statements that would tell me who you were. Right. So, for example, I shared with you that my identity can be explained in three statements. Right. So first, I am a psychologist. Uh, second, I am a professor. And third, I am a survivor. Right. But you might imagine there are a number of different statements um, you could make. Right. So, for example, you could say I am a wife. I am a mother. I am a nuclear physicist, really whatever, uh, whatever adequately describes um, what you most strongly identify uh, as, right? So, so this idea or this exercise relates to the reminiscence bump because one potential explanation is that our memory is enhanced for events that occur as our personal self-image or identity is being formed, right? And that makes sense because a lot of those critical events uh, happen in the 20s and 30s, right? So for example, most people graduate uh, college at 22, and if they go to graduate school to become a psychologist or a nuclear physicist, they usually graduate around 27 or 28. Um, Right, so there seems, and um, a lot of people get married around that time as well. Um, so all of the critical events that lead to that self-identification happen during the period that the reminiscence bump occurs. But how did psychologists uh, find evidence, experimental evidence for this hypothesis? Okay, well, like I said, they interviewed um, participants who are around the age of 54 and they asked them to complete these I am statements. Um, and the average age that they associated with each of their I am statements, right? So um, psychologists asked them to indicate how old were you when you first when you first uh, identified in this way um, and the average age was 25 which is again well within the age range for the reminiscence bump okay so the idea is that as our self image is being cultivated right or as we come to identify as a mother or a wife or a psychologist or a nuclear physicist or whatever, right? Um, the critical events that lead to that identification seem to occur sometime in early adolescence or, or in late adolescence, excuse me, or young adulthood, right? So as our self image forms, um, those events associated with that self-image become more memorable, okay? So that's the idea of the self-image hypothesis. Okay, as I mentioned though, there are two other hypotheses to explain the reminiscence bump. So let's go ahead and look at those. Okay. One other uh, sort of description that characterizes the period between the ages of 10 and 30 is that typically around this time, there are periods of rapid change, 
right? So late adolescence, early adulthood usually includes events such as moving away to college or getting your first job or, a, um, you know, other, other sorts of events um, that induce a lot of fluctuation. Right, so you're uh, developing new relationships with people. Um, you're living in a new environment. You're suddenly uh, faced with all of these new responsibilities. Right. Um, so, so the period in which the reminiscence bump occurs is typically characterized by a lot of significant changes. Right. But those significant changes are usually followed by long periods of stability, right? So from, uh, for example, the time you leave the house at 17 years old to the time where you have your first, or you matriculate into your career, if you will, at the age of 27 or 28 or 30 years of age, okay? Um, that's going to usher in a period of great stability. Right? So really, as soon as you get your first job or um, even when you have your first child, right after those abrupt changes, there tends to be uh, a lot less change that occurs after that. Right. So the notion with the cognitive hypothesis is that periods of great change that are followed by lengthy periods of stability um, tend to result in stronger encoding of memories, right? So again, in adolescence and young adulthood, you're going away to school, getting married, starting a career, okay? But after those critical events, once you matriculate into adult life, there's not a lot of changes. So the idea with this hypothesis is that, um, again, rapid change followed by stability is going to result in better encoding of those memories. And one way we can test this hypothesis is in the Western world, right, in, the develop, in developed countries, uh, most people have those periods of rapid change in their 20s and 30s. Right. But theoretically, if we could find a population where those rapid changes followed by stability happened later in life, maybe in their 30s and 40s, then we would expect this the reminiscence bump to occur during that later period. Right. So scientists were tasked then with finding a population where the rapid change followed by stability occurred later in life. So one population that, that fits that criteria is people that have immigrated into the United States, right? Because anytime you leave your home country for a new country, obviously that's going to usher in a lot of significant changes Right? But assuming that you're able to assimilate into that country and learn the language and get a job and meet people and so forth, then that rapid change is going to be followed by a stable period. Right? So what researchers did is they looked at this population of people who had immigrated into the United States and they compared people who immigrated during their 20s to people who immigrated in their 30s. So they expected for people who immigrated into their 30s, in, when they were in their 20s rather, they would show the same reminiscence bump that people who had gone to college during this period would show. Um, but for whom people who immigrated later, okay, that reminiscence bump should shift to a later period. So if we look at this line graph, on the y-axis, we have number of memories generated. And on the x-axis, we have the age of individuals at the time of the event. Okay? 
So like I said, we have two groups of people that we're comparing. So the red line on the graph shows people who immigrated between the ages of 20 and 24. And then we have people who immigrated later at the age of about 34 or 35, shown in the blue dotted line, right? And as the researchers predicted, people who immigrated in their 20s, right, like most uh, American participants, showed the standard reminiscence bump between the ages of 10 and 30. However, individuals who immig immigrated in their mid 30s, right, had a, a shifted uh, reminiscence bump, right? So they were actually able to better recall events in their life that occurred after 30, because again, this was a period that was characterized by a lot of really significant change and then followed by stability, okay? So just to recap, we've gone through two theories to explain this reminiscence bump. So the first one, the self-image hypothesis, says that we better remember events in our life that occur between the ages of 10 and 30, okay? because it's during this period that our identity forms and events associated with formation of identity uh, tend to be better remembered. The cognitive hypothesis says that we better remember events that occur between the ages of 10 and 30 because these periods are marked by a series of rapid changes, right? Such as going to college, getting a job, getting married, immigrating, etc. Um, and these periods of rapid change are typically followed by periods of relative stability, right? So anytime we have rapid change followed by stability, that's going to enhance our encoding for these particular events, okay? So that's the uh, self-image hypothesis and the cognitive hypothesis, but we have one more potential hypothesis to explain why this reminiscence bump occurs. So the last uh, task that I asked you guys to um, do in, in class, uh, the little demonstration that I had, uh, is I asked you guys to indicate at which age you thought various events in life typically occur. Right? So for example, I asked you, uh, what is the age at which people typically get married? What is the age at which people typically graduate college? What is the age at which people typically get their first job, etc. cetera? Okay. So essentially what I'm asking is I'm asking you to assess your cultural life script. Okay. So just like we have kind of an innate, or not innate rather, but um, just like our prior experiences give us scripts for various things, right? So for example, we all have a script for what happens at a birthday party. We all have a script for what happens on the first day of class. We all have a script for uh, what happens when we go to a restaurant, etc. Um, we also have a particular script for when critical events in life typically occur, and that script is usually a function of our cultural orientation, right? So we can talk about our own life story, and that is when events have occurred on an individual basis in our own personal life. But we can also talk about a cultural life script, which talks about when our particular culture or the culture we, we ascribe to expects events to occur across the lifespan. So when researchers at the University of Texas ask people to indicate when important events in a person's life typically occur, some of 
the responses they got is most people fall in love around the age of 16. Most people graduate college around the age of 22. Most people get married around the age of 27. Most people have children around the age of 28. Okay. Right. So, uh, similar to what we saw with the self-image hypothesis, right? Many of these uh, events in life, in our particular culture in the United States, happen between the ages of 10 and 30, or they happen um, in periods that are typically associated with the reminiscence bump. Okay, so it's almost like just like our our uh, scripts help us to remember what happens at a birthday party or what happens on the same on the first day of class, right? Um, events in our life are easier to recall when they fit the uh, cultural life script that we have, right? So when events in our life conform to what our cultural uh, what our culture expects us to do, we're going to have an easier time recalling those events. Okay, so one um, particular finding that seems to lend unique support to this cultural life script idea is something called the youth bias. Okay, so the youth bias is just the tendency for uh, most notable public events in a person's life um, to be perceived as occurring when the person is young. So for this particular experiment, um, people were asked to indicate, um, suppose there is an infant, right? So suppose you have an infant um, that is your gender, and also lives in the same part of the country where you live, okay? And think about events in this person's life. So people were asked to indicate if you had to isolate the most important event in this person's life, when do you think that most important event is likely to occur? So if you had to think about the most important or most noteworthy event of this person's life, what age do you think they're going to be when this event occurs? And interestingly, whether the researchers asked older people or younger people, they tended to guess that the most important life event in this hypothetical scenario would occur before the age of 30. So again, regardless of age, regardless of any other individuating characteristics, people tend to assume that the most important events that shape a person's life are going to occur before the age of 30. So what that suggests, again, is that one of the reasons why we have an easier time remembering events between the ages of 10 and 30 is that our culture uh, sort of demands or predicts that the most important things in our life are going to occur during this period. Okay, so just to sum up what we've talked about so far, guys, um, I have defined autobiographical memory as memory for events or experiences in one's life um, that can either refer to a specific episode or a specific instance or refer to a fact that you've acquired over multiple instances. Okay, um, autobiographical memories are going to be represented in the mind as multidimensional or having a bunch of different um, primarily sensory features or features associated with a particular sensory modality. Um, and autobiographical memories occur all across the lifespan, 
right? So each one of us has the ability to recall events all the way from childhood, all the way up to um, our most recent age, even those of us who are older and around the age of 50 or 60 years of age. Um, but there seems to be a critical period between the ages of 10 and 30 where we have an easier time recalling uh, events. Okay, um, so the way that we explain this reminiscence bump is that uh, between the ages of 10 and 30, our identity is formed. So events associated with that identity formation are going to be easier to recall. Between the ages of 10 and 30, we also have periods of rapid change followed by relative stability, which is going to make these events easier to recall. And lastly, in the Western or um, developed world, Right? We tend to ascribe the most important events in one's life as occurring before the age of 30. So our culture sort of mandates um, that these events are going to occur. And because we have um, this cultural script to follow, that's also going to enhance our memory for these particular events. Okay, so that's all I have for us um, for this particular lecture, um, and I will follow up with two more lectures. Uh, the first one is going to be on uh, what are called flashbulb memories, um, and the second set of lectures is going to be on the seven sins of memory. Okay, so if you guys have any questions or if I can help you at all, um, please let me know, and I will... I guess you guys will be hearing from me again soon. All right, have a great day.